Hello, congregation, family, and friends. I pray that all is well with you. Welcome to this edition of Bible Talk. This is uh, part two of our study of the letter of Second John. We started it uh, last time, and it's a it's a letter that very often gets neglected. Uh, at the end of the New Testament, we tend to see uh, a lot of sermons and teachings brought on First John. Of course, we have the book of Revelation, but sometimes Second and Third John get lost. And so we started that last week, and I had run out of time. We were doing the salutation. We had gotten through the first three verses of Second John, and I had wanted to add some additional information about the word lady and children. And so let me just recap real quick. In 2 John, there are two main schools of thought uh, when it comes to who this elect lady is and her children. Uh, the first thought is that the elect lady is talking about the church and her children, of course, meaning the individual members of the church. The second thought is that the elect lady is an actual person. Uh, an actual person that was addressed by John, and her children were actually her biological children. That is the camp that I am coming from. That has always been my understanding of this. And I wanted to give to you some additional information that you could write down and look up for yourself uh, to see if what you're being told is true and whether it makes sense to you. So let's say this. Let's talk about the word lady, okay? I want to give you some scripture references before we move on with the letter. The word lady appears only twice in the entire New Testament, and both of them appear in this letter. The only other uses of the word lady are both in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, and we can find that in Isaiah 47, verse 5, and also Isaiah 47, verse 7. So the Bible does lean towards the teaching that everywhere the word lady is used, it seems to indicate an individual person as opposed to a corporate body. I want you to also notice, now we're not going to get to these verses tonight, but notice that in this letter, in the verse 10, it says your house. In the verse 12, it says come unto you, indicating physical things. Could these be interpreted in a corporate sense of the church? I think they could. But when we consider verse 13 in 2 John, where it says, the children of your chosen sister greet you, that is definitely in a, in a human, more personal context, as opposed to the corporate church context. Because we see throughout this letter the family dynamic, the family connection that John is bringing. And so before we moved on with our study for tonight, I just wanted to give you that information and those four references. Twice in the book of Isaiah in chapter 47 is the word lady used. And then twice in this letter, we have it obviously in verse 1, and then we have it here in verse 5, which we will be getting to tonight. And so I think it does make a compelling argument when we see all of them, all of those references, that lady is a particular person. The other thing I want to point out is when you look at Second John and Third John, they're written very similarly. They are personal letters to people. In Second John, we have the chosen lady or the elect lady and her children. And in Third John, he's writing to a friend of his called Gaius. And then they both begin the same way. So I believe that we're on safe ground when we say that this is written more towards a person and her family as opposed to the, the corporate church and the members of the church. So I hope that that makes sense to you. We're going to continue in our look of Second John. Good evening, everyone, all those who have joined tonight. We are going to continue in verse 4 tonight because now we're moving into a section of the letter that I'm calling a warning concerning heresy. It's a warning concerning heresy, and we're going to be looking at verses 4, 5, and 6 tonight. That is at least my goal for tonight. I have the King James here. I also have the New American Standard, should we need it tonight. In verse 4 of Second John, it says this, I rejoiced greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth, as we have received a commandment from the Father. John has found this lady's children walking in truth. The apostle is pleased. He rejoices that what he's discovered about her children continues to be true. Let's talk about the word walking here, okay? When we talk about walking, when we walk, it involves every area of our body, doesn't it? When we're walking and we're actively moving, our lungs are pumping, our heart is pumping, we're breathing air, our arms are moving. Our legs are moving. We're probably moving our head from side to side. In other words, when we're walking, 
it, it, it's all of us. Not part of us goes for a walk and part of us stays behind, if you follow what I'm saying. When we're walking, when we are moving, all of us are going together at the same time. Our entire body, everything. We don't leave something behind. The point that John is making, and I think that he's making here, is that walking is an ongoing, continuous process. The principle here is that following the truth of the gospel involves daily commitment, daily activity. It's following the gospel every single day with everything that we do. We're not just to walk some and then stop. We're not to just, we're not to just walk occasionally. If you follow what I'm saying, let's look at this verse again and see what he's saying. Verse four, I rejoiced greatly. John is pleased. He is thrilled to find out that this lady's children are walking in truth. I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth. So the question then becomes, are you walking in truth today? Notice that John is not saying that the children have walked or they occasionally walk. He says walking, ongoing, each day that God gives us, every new morning that we have, we are to walk in God's commandments. We are to walk in his truth. Are you walking every day in his truth? Or are there some days you just take off? Are there some days that you just don't want to follow God? You're not as diligent in your walk. You're not as passionate about the Lord. Are there just some days that you're just dragging? Or are you walking? Are you walking towards deeper spiritual fulfillment and deeper spiritual growth, more understanding of the word, falling more in love with the Lord Jesus Christ, wanting to be more and more Christ-like? Are you walking? Are you constantly striving and walking in truth? That is what John is asking us tonight as we're looking at this scripture. Are we walking in truth? Are you? We face the very same issue today when we're, when we're looking at this walking issue. You know, some walk and some don't walk. Some believe and some don't believe. And that's what we have here, not only uh, back in Bible times, but also today. We face the same issue. Look, it, it comes down very, very simple. Either a person is a believer or they're not. They're, they either have the truth or they don't have the truth. You can't be in both camps. You're either a believer or you're not a believer. That's what, that's what it comes down to. We're either walking in the truth or we're walking in lies or falsehoods or deceptions. There's only one truth. And, and those of you who follow me see I post this all the time. There's one truth. It's called the Bible. The truth is the Bible. The truth is in the Bible. You cannot find truth anywhere else. And so if you're going to be walking in truth, you need to be walking in accordance with the scriptures, in accordance with the Bible. And that's what John is talking about. John is going to spend the next two verses discussing the foundation for truth. And he's going to do that because he has to contrast what the truth is before he gets into the heresy and what's being brought by the false teachers. And that begins in verse 7. Chances are we won't get to that tonight. We'll look at that next time. But John has to lay a foundation. He has to make it clear what he's talking about and, and distinguish between what truth is and what false preaching is and false teaching and false prophets. Because as much as there is today, there was just as many back then. There's more now because there's more people in the world and there's more heresies going out. And, and elsewhere in the Bible, we do read about that where God says as the time gets closer, there's going to be more and more people that have itching ears and people will tell them what they want to hear. That means they're not telling the truth. They're telling them feel good stuff. That's a whole other message. What we want to focus on today and the question that I have for you as we're looking at this verse is, are you walking in the truth? And only you can answer that. That's between you and God. Are you walking in the truth? Let's move on to verse 5 because he starts talking about in verse 4, he talks about walking in truth. But now in verse 5, he's going to shift it, and now he's talking about walking in love. It's, it's still walking, but it's different. Verse 5, And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. Didn't Jesus tell us to love one another? Isn't that one of the great commandments? 
John 13, 34, remember when the young man came up to Jesus and he said, you know, teacher or master, what is the greatest of all the commandments? And what did God say? First one, love God with all your mind, heart, soul, strength, with everything that's in you. And number two, love each other. They're the two great commandments. And so John is saying, now I beseech you, lady, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you, not as though I wrote a new commandment. John's not writing anything new. He has no authority to do that. There's no reason for him to write anything new. It says, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. John is pleading with her. It's a personal request for those in the truth, but especially to those who are not in the truth. Do you see that? You see, as true believers, it's our responsibility to those we know, to those whom God places in our life, to share the gospel with them. Our task is to share the truth with them and encourage them to walk in truth. Now, understand what I'm going to say. We are not responsible, nor can we get anyone saved. What we do is we share our testimony, we share the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ with other people, and we let God bring the increase. You know the, the verse says, some water, some plant, some water, but God gives the increase. Only God can open a person's heart and mind to the truth of the gospel and bring them into salvation, a knowledge of salvation through Christ. Only God can do that. I can't do that, and you can't do that. But we do have a responsibility, a mandate a mandate to share the gospel with other people, to share the truth with other people. Now, it is interesting. John, as, as I said here, he's not writing a new commandment because he doesn't have the authority to do so. And there's no need for him to write anything new. What Jesus said, what Jesus taught was absolute perfection. It can't not be better, can it? Well, everything that Jesus said was the gospel. Now, Here's something that you may not, I hope to connect these two things together. And I made a few notes here so that I don't lose myself. When John says here in verse 5, And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote you a new commandment, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. Well, let's think about this word beginning. Was it the beginning when Jesus said, here's one of the great commandments that you love one another? That wasn't the beginning. It couldn't be. Whenever you think of the beginning, what do you think of? I go all the way back to Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's a good point, Val. Sharing the gospel with the world is a way of walking in love. That's right. If we truly love other people, we want them to be saved. We want them to come to truth. So let me see if we if you can follow this here for me, okay, or with me. When John mentions the beginning, we can reference this all the way back to Adam and Eve, our first parents and their children. Now, hear me out on this. In God's love, he created Adam and Eve. In his love, he gave them children. In his love, he gave them a perfect place to live with everything they could possibly want. Every one of their needs met. But God realized after he created Adam, he said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a help me for him. So God created a woman. He brought her to the man and performed the first marriage. Why? Because he loved his creation. He loved Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve loved God, and God loved Adam and Eve. They were in fellowship. God would visit them. He would walk through the garden in the cool of the day. He gave them a perfect garden to live in and everything that they would ever need. And that is love. Again, in God's love, he gave the first human beings, he gave them children. We read about that in Genesis 4. And in spite of their sins, in spite of the fall of mankind, God provided for their spiritual needs, their physical needs, their emotional needs. He provided food and shelter and a place to live and fellowship. Now, if that's not love, I don't know what is. So when, when, when John is talking about what we've heard from the beginning, we're not talking about just when Jesus got here. We have to go all the way back to the beginning. I hope you're tracking with me on this. Sometimes we can be blind. Let's face it. We can be blind to the love that God has for his people since the beginning. We read about the Old Testament and we see rebellion. 
We see nations rise up against nations. We see God bringing judgment, not only upon Israel, but other nations. Sometimes we look at that and we say, where is that love? How is God a loving God when he's destroying people? When people are allowed to kill one another, when all of this pestilence and disease and all of this evil has come into the world, how can you say that God is love? How can you say that that's love? How is that possible, that it's love? God's love did not begin with just Christ's commandment in John 13. We have to be clear about this. I submit this to you. I will say this to you, that if you look carefully, and I'll challenge you to this, okay? I say that you can find God's love on every single page of the Bible. Did you hear me? I say you can find God's love on every single page of the Bible. I don't care where you open scripture. I don't care where you open it, what book you look into, open it at random and read a page and I guarantee you, you will find God's love. Why do I say that? Because the Bible says that God is love. Yes, he's a God of judgment. Yes, he is a God of law and order. And yes, he's not a God to be messed with. He's not a God that we're going to get away with things, but he's also ultimately a God of love. What was the ultimate act of love on God's part? He sent Jesus to die on a cross for all those who would believe in him. And all of those, you and I, those who are true believers, anybody who's listening or watching this, if you're a true believer, God loved you enough to send his son to die for you. If that's not love, then none of us have any idea whatsoever as to what love is. John is trying to, remember, John has to build a foundation on what love is because once the heretics come in and, and once the false teachers come in, they're going to take everything in a whole different direction and it has nothing to do with God's love or God's sympathy for people or empathy for people. False teaching and false prophets do nothing but bring evil and death and destruction into the world. John's going to warn against this, but first he has to build that foundation. Now, let's look at something else here. When we see the word heard here in verse 5, it says, And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I give you a new commandment unto thee, but that which we have from the beginning, that we love one another. And then in verse 6 he says, And this is love, that we walk after his commandment. This is the commandment that as ye have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. John is now defining exactly what love is. We're to walk after his commandments. In other words, we're to be Christ-like. In verse 5, the commandment is to love. But here in verse 6, the definition to love is to walk daily, ongoing commitment after Jesus. We are incapable of this kind of love if we do not obey the commandments. Love is not just a feeling. It's the action of doing something. So let me, let me pause with this as we're looking at this. Let me read these three verses again so we get the context of what we're looking at. John said, I rejoiced greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth as we have received the commandment from the Father. And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote, wrote a new commandment unto you, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment, that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. Now, when he says the word heard, we have to talk about that for a moment. Heard would encompass all of the writings and all the oral traditions relating to the scriptures, beginning with the law of Moses all the way to the day in which John was writing the letter. It simply relates to the truth and the love that God has given us and consequently what we're to give to others. So let's talk about this for a minute as we're talking about this walking some of you who are on here, I know where you're at in your spiritual walk with Jesus. Others, maybe I'm not as sure of. But here's a couple of questions that we need to ask ourselves. Number one, here's some questions to kind of jot down and think about it. Number one, are you sure of the truth? Are you sure that you know the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ? That's number one. Are you sure? 
And if the answer to that is yes, then number two, are you sharing that truth with others as God gives you opportunity to do so? Only you can answer that question. It's between you and God. Number three, if you have the truth and you're sharing the truth with others, does your daily living meet up with what you say you believe? In other words, are you walking actively with God? Are you a full-time Christian serving a full-time God, or are you a part-time person? Do you just serve God when things are going well? Do you just thank Him and praise Him when blessings are flowing into your life? Or are you serving Him equally as hard, equally as diligent, when things maybe aren't going so well? When you have questions up in the air, when you have a situation you've been praying for and God hasn't answered? Let me share this with you. There are two petitions that I've had up before the Lord for well over a year. I pray for them every day. Others pray for those petitions. Two petitions. I will tell you, as of this moment in time, God has not answered either petition. Does that mean that I stop walking in truth? Does that mean that I, that I, that I, that I stop praying to God and beseeching Him to answer my petitions? No. The way I approach God is this. Lord, please remember my petitions before you. In other words, it is God's sovereign right whether He wants to answer the petitions or not answer them. But that doesn't mean that if he chooses not to answer, that I to stop walking in truth, or I'm to turn away, or I'm to stop sharing the gospel with others, or I'm to stop walking on a daily basis with my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That wouldn't be right. That's like a fair-weathered friend that one day they're your friend, and then the next day they're not your friend. They don't want to be around you. That's not the way things work. If we have the truth, John is saying, are you walking in truth. That means as much today as tomorrow as the next day. And hopefully as we're growing in our faith together, as you and I are growing in the truth, as we understand scripture more, as we understand the gospel more, as we become more and more in love with Jesus Christ, we should be walking in the truth more and more and more fervently every single day. You can't deviate. You can't fall off the path and decide One day you want to be a Christian and one day you don't want to be. Because if that's your mindset, maybe you were never a true born again Christian to to begin with. When you're truly born again, you can't just go back on that and decide one day you don't want to be born again. That's not the way it works. When God saves you, you are saved. And we have a commandment. Look, John said, I have found your children walking in truth just as we received from the Father, I beseech you, I'm not writing you a new commandment, dear lady, but that which we heard from the beginning. What? That we love one another. And this is love. Here's the definition. That we follow and we walk after his commandments. Whatever you've heard from the beginning, walk in it. So let me challenge you with this tonight. Wherever you are in your walk with Jesus, wherever you are in your understanding of the Bible and truth and the gospel, wherever you are, let me encourage you to keep walking, keep walking, keep seeking, keep reaching towards the ultimate truth. I tell you all the time, uh, and maybe some of you get tired of seeing it, you know, read your Bibles, be a Berean. Acts 17, 11, search the scriptures daily. They didn't search it whenever they felt like it. They searched the scriptures daily to make sure that what they were hearing, what they were being taught, what they heard being preached was the truth. How do we know what the truth is? The truth is in the Bible. You will not find truth anywhere else. The world doesn't have it. No other religion has it. No other faith has it. Truth is found in one place the Holy Bible. Truth is Christ. Truth is the gospel. Truth is that he gave his life for all those who would believe on him. That is the truth. And so the big lesson for tonight, because next week we're going to get into the doctrine of the false teachers. We're going to begin in verse 7. And we're going to see exactly how damning and how destructive the heresies of false teachers can be. Not only back then, but you'll see how it equates to even today, those that are bringing heresies and false teachings and leading literally millions to hell with them. If you don't have the truth tonight, you can still have the truth. 
You can still find the truth. It's found in scripture. It begins with Jesus Christ. It begins with having a personal relationship with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for all those who would believe on him. That would be your beginning of your walk with truth. So let me encourage you as we close tonight for Bible talk, as we close, because I don't want to get into the next section because it, it'll take us in a different direction. I want us to focus tonight and you to focus tonight on your walk with Jesus, your walk in the truth. Make sure that your walk is steady, it's straight, it's not deviating towards false gospels and false preachers, that it, you keep your focus, keep looking at Jesus, keep your eyes on Jesus and in his word. Study the scriptures. Be in the Bible as much as you can. Walk with your head up, knowing that if you have the truth and you're walking in truth, you have eternal security. You have the truth in you and you know that the truth is in Jesus Christ, nowhere else. That's where truth is. So my prayer and my hope for you, for those that I speak with during the week or, or every day as, as we're walking together, let's learn the truth together. Let's walk with Jesus together. We are here to encourage one another. We are here to love one another. So as I, as I end this, keep walking with Jesus. Keep your walk steady. Don't stop. Don't deviate. Even if there's some days that you're stumbling, keep walking forward every day. Keep walking towards the truth. I pray that this Bible talk has been a blessing to you uh, as we're looking at this letter of Second John. It's an often neglected letter, and I pray that you can see all these nuggets of truth here. I, I pray that you see that, and I pray that you will read the entire letter. It's 13 verses to get the whole context. The next Bible talk, we're going to start in verse 7, and we're going to start looking at the doctrine of the false teachers. If you've learned something tonight, if you've been convicted of something, if you know someone that needs to hear this message, please share it with them. Uh, the Bible tells us, Isaiah 55, 11, God said, His word will not return void. It will reach those people He intends it to reach. If it's reached you tonight, if you know someone that needs to see this and hear this message, I ask you that you send this out to whoever. Has not nothing to do with me, has nothing to do with you. We are just humble servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm doing what God has called me to do. I'm not doing it for likes and I'm not doing it for popularity. I don't care about that. What I care about is the truth of God's word. And I pray that I was able to share truth with you tonight and that you would turn around and share it with someone else. Thanks for being with me tonight for Bible Talk. God bless you.